welcome to This Week in Washington, Independent Sector's Policy Update on COVID-19 Response and Recovery. I'm Ben Kershaw, Director of Public Policy and Government Relations at Independent Sector. Uh, for those of you who are joining us for the first time, welcome. Um, Independent Sector is a national membership organization representing a diverse set of nonprofits, foundations, and corporate giving programs working to ensure that all people living in the United States thrive. Uh, today, in addition to um, our longstanding partner, Wes Coulomb, uh, we are joined by Kevin Kincello, uh, Senior Policy Advisor to Senator James Lankford. Uh, as part of our webinar feature, all lines are currently muted. We will pause periodically for questions. To ask questions, please use the Q&A box. Um, you can also email public policy at independentsector.org. This webinar will be recorded and posted on the IS website. It'll be emailed to you within 24 hours. Um, we will ask when you leave um, that you complete a really short survey to help us um, tailor content to meet your needs. Um, so while we are recording, um, I will also um, remind folks that our conversation today, um, most specifically our conversation with Kevin and with all congressional staff is off the record for press purposes. Um, you are always welcome to contact independent sectors, press operation, um, I know, I know from working in the Senate that they also have robust press operations and would love to hear from you as well. Uh, our conversation today is open to all members of the nonprofit community. It is not being limited to independent sector members, but uh, these are the sorts of things that historically a lot of organizations have only made available to members. Um, and so if this is um, content and work that you want to continue to partner with us all on. Um, boy, we'd love to have you as members of the independent sector community. So I want to turn now to, to Kevin. Um, Kevin, we're really glad to have you with us. Um, I, won't, um, I won't numb folks with a long bio, but Kevin has been with Senator Langford since Senator Langford started in the Senate in 2015, and he worked for him in the House of Representatives before that. Um, Kevin also worked for Senator Tom Coburn, um, also of Oklahoma, um, before working in the House of Representatives. Kevin handled budget, tax, and health care issues for Senator Lankford. And um, just in case um, Kevin doesn't want to brag too much on his boss, I should just note that Senator Lankford um, has recently co-led an effort that we'll be talking about in a moment um, to improve the CARES Act for nonprofits. He championed an effort in when the CARES Act was being written to uh, improve the charitable deduction in that. He championed repeal of the parking lot and transit benefits tax uh, last year. Um, and he comes to this, Senator Langford does, after 20 years in ministry, um, including experience directing the largest youth camp in America. Um, so both Kevin and Senator Langford have a, a deep experience and passion for the issues of the nonprofit sector. Um, so Kevin, I, I just mentioned this letter that you all led, um, co-led recently. Can you tell us a little bit about that letter um, and how that effort went? Sure. Thanks, Ben. I appreciate the very kind introduction. Uh, yeah, so we along with Senator King um, and his great team, um, led a letter to both Leader McConnell and Leader Schumer, um, essentially asking for three broad broad things uh, when in the, in the context of kind of CARES 2.0 or however you wanna to refer to it, um, essentially asking for access to the PPP and lifting the, the 500 employee cap um, also asking for additional relief on the unemployment insurance front because we've heard from so many of our nonprofits in our state across the nation that are really struggling and could, re could really use some help. Um, and then um, additionally, the last one is on the universal charitable deduction. I'm sure all the folks on this, on this call are aware of the $300 deduction that made it in to the CARES Act. Um, we were fighting for quite a bit, quite a bit uh, more than that, but we 
settled at 300 and we were grateful to get that into CARES initially. And so that kind of gives us a baseline of things to work off of for this fourth round of relief. Um, so that's kind of, that, those are the three big asks that were in the letter. We had 15 Democrats, 15 Republicans sign on, so it was very well balanced and a really good showing, we thought. So we sent that out last week. Got it. And, you know, the number of folks on the phone, you know, certainly including independent sector, worked um, in close partnership with, with you and Senator King to um, encourage senators to join that letter. Um, and we're, you know, just want to reemphasize our, our gratitude for that effort. Um, maybe um, you mentioned a couple things, pieces of that letter, um, notably expanded access to the Paycheck Protection Program, um, loan forgiveness for, you know, for nonprofits of all different sizes. Um, we saw a bill get released in the House of Representatives a couple days ago. Um, we expect a vote on it tomorrow in the House. Uh, there's some there's some overlap with what what you your bipartisan letter called for and what's in what's in this bill. Um, do you, do you have a do you have a take on on those specifics and maybe on the on the bill overall? That's right, Ben. We're and we're still working through the specifics of it. It was, I think, the whole bill was 1,800 pages long. So there's a lot there to, to digest. Um, but there is yes. some overlap. You're absolutely right, and we're we were glad to see that there could be some common ground from which to work with um, with our House counterparts. So we're we're kind of taking that back right now and and starting to kind of see what's there, see what what we can bring to the table as well, and see where we can meet. Um, kind of for for the fourth round here, so I think it, there was there was some op, some room for optimism. I thought um, in the specific to the nonprofit space, so we were we were glad to see that there were. I can't speak to all of the other additional policies that were in in the Heroes Act, uh, but there was a, a few good things there uh, related to the nonprofits that we can I think we can work with. So that was good. Great. So. Our I mean, should I should I take this to mean, Kevin, that you you don't think that the Senate's just going to take up the this bill and pass it as is? You think you all might might be weighing in on this issue as well? I think we may be weighing in on it as well. Uh, <laughs> I don't think we're going to be taking it up wholesale. Um, I think it remains to be seen at this point, um, kind of what the process is and certainly what the timing is. Um, just Kevin speaking here, but I, I do see that this slipping beyond the Memorial Day recess most likely. Um, so I think that the timing is slipping a little bit, but not much. There's still urgency on both sides. We still have priorities that we want to see get into the next, you know, whatever the next package looks like. So, but no, we're not going to be taking up the House bill wholesale and putting it on the Senate floor, it, I don't think. So, but we'll see. Got it. Um, and so, you know, I know that you and, and your boss certainly appreciate the, you know, you mentioned urgency, you know, there's a, a real urgency around a lot of these issues for, for the nonprofit sector. Um, I, I want to dig in a little bit more. You mentioned the, the charitable deduction a couple times. Uh, and then, so I would, I would remind folks again that uh, Kevin's boss, along with um, other bipartisan, you know, group of senators, champion that effort to um, significantly increase the, the cap in the CARES Act, um, you know, up to a third of the standard deduction. Um, both from your, from your letter and from your conversations with colleagues, um, what, are you, what are you hearing about that effort? Um, you know, that diving into how much it means to us, as you know, um, what, what are you hearing about that? Sure. No, I think, uh, I mean, efforts are, are ongoing. Um, we have kind of a, we've developed sort of a core group of, of six in the Senate, uh, Senator Langford, of course, um, and we have on our side, Senator Tim Scott and Senator Mike Lee are involved. And then on the Democrat side, we have Senator Coons, uh, Senator Klobuchar, and also Senator uh, Shaheen as well. So that's kind of the core group of six that offered that amendment and CARES uh, and just to run through exactly what that was quickly, uh, during the initial debate on CARES, we offered an amendment that would provide a universal charitable deduction 
for the 2020 tax year. Um, so you could take advantage of it through the full retroactive back to January. And we would value that at up to one third of the standard deduction. So 4,000 for individuals, 8,000 for, for married filers, joint filers. Um, and that would be again available for this specific tax year. Um, we think for uh, this next round of negotiations, we're still gonna be pushing for probably that same concept. Everyone's supportive and everyone's on board with that. Um, it, there's some talk about how, how much do you value it out? Do you go a little higher? Um, do you stick with the one third of the standard deduction given that we only were able to get the $300 in CARES? Um, so, you know, there's scoring concerns we're having to work through and things like that. But essentially that's, I think, what it's gonna look like this time around. Now, there's also a, a separate conversation around using this moment to make a charitable, a universal charitable deduction permanent beyond just 2020. Um, there's, I think Senator Lee is working on a proposal to sort of do that as well, and it would take it up to the full standard deduction. Um, so that would be, again, beyond 2020, but there were, there's talk about maybe building in a giving floor at 1% of AGI or something like that. So those are, these are all ongoing conversations and they're sort of dual tracked efforts that we're trying to kind of come to consensus on. And do we, you know, it's a, there's a strategic question of whether do we want to try to get in sort of the 2020 COVID direct response version just you know, in this next version, or do we want to sort of lump it all together and try to get, make it permanent? Um, so we're kind of working through all those details right now, but those are the, the big conversations. We're also talking a lot with the Senate Finance Committee and with leadership in terms of what they would like to see and the parameters that they would like to, us to work within. So we're, like, we're talking to them almost every week um, to make sure that we're on the same page there and they're, they know what to expect when we come to them with a kind of an ask so that's kind of where things stand at this point, Ben. Hey, Ben, can I try Go ahead, Wes. Yeah, hey, Kevin, uh, thanks for that uh, good uh, summary and kind of where things stand. What about the expansion to the 2019 uh, tax returns as part of that conversation uh, on the UCD, given it only applies to 2020 at the, at the moment? Yeah, that's a great question, Wes. We're actually, we're, we're working on language there on legislative text to do that. I fully expect that we'll be able to include that in this next version. We didn't, we didn't have that in the amendment uh, during CARES during that debate, but we're gonna make that change this time around. Um, there's a lot of bipartisan support to do that and it shouldn't be a, too hard of a lift. And so we're, we're working towards that goal as well. Gotcha, thanks. Yep. When, when, you, when you say it, to include that in this next version, Kevin, are you, are you talking about the next version of this amendment or, you know, you think there's a really good chance that it'll be part of the, you know, whatever Senate bill or deal gets negotiated? Right. I think both, both would be the answer to that, Ben. We're trying to update the text of our amendment so that it, we can make the change in CARES for 2.0. There's so many names for it now, but that's what we're trying to get that text updated yeah. so we get it into the mix in this, this round of negotiations. Got it. Um, you know, it, it sounds like um, you, know, you mentioned this effort to, to make things permanent, to make permanent policy changes. Uh, I, I think that, um, you know, as, as you know, our, our community has thought that a charitable deduction was a, was a good idea for a long time. Um, so it, right, it, it sort of seems like a, as much or even more a strategic question than a policy question. Right. Do you think, how do you think other folks, you know, in other offices, you know, around the Senate would approach that strategic question? It's really, it's a good question, Ben. It's really very member by member at this point. Um, I mean, my boss is, has been working on a, a permanent solution to this since, you know, tax reform, even before the, the TCJA in, in 2017. And how do you structure it? What's the right level to set it at? Um, there's, there's, of course, cost concerns that we have to work through, but we want to actually find a way to work through those and get something permanent on the books. So each office really has a different take on it. Um, and so if we can come to some consensus within this core group of the six offices on a bipartisan basis uh, and then have that ready to take to leadership, I think that gives us a huge leg up. So, you know, if there is a chance um, and we can and get also consensus within the nonprofit sector, 
uh, which I think is going to be a bit of a challenge, but we, we certainly want to work towards that end. Um, we want to, we want to work on that. Uh, and so we're going to, we're going to, I think we're going to separate these two efforts a little bit and keep the COVID response 2020 version while also simultaneously working on what the permanent induction looks like. So if, if there's a chance to be able to merge those together in, in this, you know, this crunch time frame that we have, that's great. We want to do that. But if not, um, we want to at least get the direct COVID done, you know, this in this tranche of relief. Got it. So on the topic of um, of the UCD still um, and, and this $300 cap, um, you know, one of our one of our um, attendees notes the the Penn Wharton budget model that um, modeled this $300 cap and found that it's, um, you know, maybe not surprisingly to, to some of us, not as effective at encouraging giving. Um, are you hearing, in, you know, are you hearing feedback from, you know, from folks around the Senate concern about that model and how are you thinking about that estimate? No, th that's a really good question. Um, we have heard that's sort of the, the first line of pushback that we get whenever we propose this policy and start getting into kind of in the weeds discussions. Um, that that article that came out and the, the model that they run that it cited sort of talked about how there was, wasn't was as much of a bang for the buck. Um, there was a substantial revenue loss without much economic stimulus that came along with it. And I think we look at it a little bit differently. We're not exactly looking to you know, get economic stimulus out of this as much as we are hold up our, our nonprofits, our charities, our churches, our folks that are working in the communities to sort of help folks, you know, weather the storm. So I, I think of that as a little bit different from just something that's going to, a, a policy that's going to stimulate the economy in the short, medium term. So I, I try to, right. to get folks to kind of separate those out a little bit um, and kind of understand what our true goal is, and that's to help nonprofits that are struggling so that they can go out and help our neighbors. So that's kind of how I think about it and what I've been telling folks. Got it. You know, I think there's also the, the perspective that um, the best way mathematically to increase the bang for the buck within the current, you know, structure of how this deduction works is to raise the cap. Right. Um, exactly. You know, there's there's modeling, right? We've the independent sector has commissioned modeling about a a few different proposals, um, and you know certainly a higher cap brings more dollars into charities, um, and to the extent people are interested in comparing, you know, dollars lost in federal revenue to dollars going into charities, that a comparison that I think IS would would dispute, and I know. Your boss has opinions about that too. Um, you know, those numbers get a lot closer the the higher that cap goes. Um, so appreciate yeah. that. Yeah. Um, before I turn back to questions from um, from others, Wes, do you have? Is there anything you wanted to to jump in with here as I look for questions? Uh, I just want to thank Kevin for all your good work on on this. Um, maybe just think about uh, who else. You know, you have your 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 good core group of six in the Senate, but anybody else you think that we might be able to think about uh, working with? Obviously, Kia talked to you know Chairman Grassley and Ranking Member Wyden, but anybody else and leadership as well. Anybody else you think we might be able to go to uh, to go reach out to? And also, what else can we do as a sector to kind of help you in these efforts, kind of bolster what you guys are doing? on the Senate side this next next round to get things done. Oh, definitely, Wes. I think, um, yeah, I mean, we've been working very, very closely with um, Chairman Grassley staff, Ranking Member Wyden staff as well. Um, I think good folks to reach out to are the, the group of 30 that signed on to the, the um, Lankford King nonprofit support letter. I think reaching out to those offices would be great because I think we're going to have a lot of common commonality there. And we, and we mentioned this policy within the letter. So I think we're going to have a lot of great reception from those folks. Um, working closely with uh, Congressman Walker's office as well in the House and trying to get sort of a, a, a companion effort. I know uh, uh, their staff is, is working on this to try to sort of push this on their side as well. So I think those those folks would be good to reach out to Congressman Davis as well, who's their the Democrat counterpart 
would be good. Mm -hmm. So I think starting there would be a good place to begin kind of discussions um, to kind of get, get some more momentum going in, the, in this time. Yeah, that'd be helpful. Definitely, we'll do that. Thanks. Absolutely. Um, so Kevin, one, I, you know, I think one last question for you before I, um, you know, maybe open it up for any final comments you have. Um, there, you know, the, the charitable sector, as I think you know, has a long list of priorities for um, policy changes that need to happen in order for for us to continue meeting urgent community needs. Um, are there are there other issues that that you and Senator Lankford are working on um, within the context of these bills? that you know, maybe we don't think of as charitable sector issues, but that, that we should be aware of. Um, I don't want us to, to stay too you know, kind of pigeonholed on, on the, the many issues we're working on. Are there other issues your boss's priority list that we should be thinking about? That's a good question. I mean, we've been just in the immediate term, we've been really focused on, you know, obviously the universal charitable, but also getting access to the PPP for mid to large size, you know, nonprofits who are also struggling just as much as it, as much as some of the smaller um, that we folks that we have. And so I think we've had some really good conversations with with Treasury, um, with leadership with other Senate offices there to kind of get that immediate access to capital and sync it up with some of the Fed lending facilities that already exist for mid to, to large size businesses. So I think that would be an effort that we're trying to undertake to, to sort of get immediate help right now. Um, but as things come up on, that you're seeing on your list, we would please reach out, send them to us that we can we can start alerting folks here about and start working on with the various finance uh, committees of jurisdiction. So please reach out and let us know. But yeah, those are, and then unemployment insurance obviously is a huge, huge issue, especially for the self-funded uh, folks. Um, so those, those three areas are really the, the kind of the big three, but if there are others that we should be, you know, focused on, please, please let us know and we'll get those on the list. Will do. I think you, I think, you know, we're, we're not a shy community. Not so, at all. Um, I'm sure. I'm sure. Uh, yeah. Um, Kevin, I, you know, want to just, Thank you so much. Um, I want to make sure there wasn't anything else Wes was looking to add um, before I um, before we you know really express our profound gratitude for you and let you go. Yeah, well, I think Wes did yeah, yeah. one more thing. Is Kevin, you Kevin, do you still have a minute? Absolutely. Yeah. Okay, just, just, just to build my other uh, comment, what do you think uh, as we kind of go into this next uh, phase of negotiations? Anything that we can kind of help you with as far as uh, data or information as you kind of help you and your efforts as well as any areas in which you're getting a little pushback from the committee or otherwise that we can uh, help to address overcoming sort of hurdles or objections that might uh, stand in the way of getting something done. Yeah, the great question was, I, I think um, any data that you have uh, that can kind of show the COVID impact on the sector as a whole. I mean, we could we could use all the anecdotal data we can get, but if you have anything a little more broad, we'd love to take a look at kind of giving trends and what the actual impacts have been so far. Um, and then just real quick on the, uh, the uh, charitable deduction side of this, um, one of the pieces of pushback that we've received is around the, the policing and enforcement of substantiation. Um, we, do, we do want to address that if we can, but we want to do it do so in a way that's not disproportionately harmful to to nonprofits and folks that are acting in good faith. Um, but we do want to respond to committee concerns and other folks that have reached out on that. So if there are there are ways that um, you know that you see that we could take that and address that in a in a, in a way that would would kind of scratch that itch, I guess, for the for the committees, please please let us know because we're working through that right now and trying to find something that actually works. Uh, something that the IRS and Treasury can can do, it wouldn't be a huge lift administratively for them. So we'd love to to have your feedback on that. Um, so I think those are that would be the the big one at this point. Great, thanks a lot. Great. Yep. Yeah. Uh, so again, I, I want to thank Kevin Kincello from Senator Lankford's office. 
um, Kevin, we, we appreciate your time today and all your bosses work on behalf of these, these key priorities. Uh, we look forward to, we look forward to bugging you um, and staying in touch um, and being as helpful as we can um, as you seek to, you know, to make these positive changes for the sector and the, and the people we all serve. Um, so Kevin, thank you so much for joining us. I really appreciate that, Ben. Thank you so much for having me. I uh, look forward to working with you as we kind of work our way into this next round of relief. And uh, thank you for all the support so far. And we, we hope to get this done sooner than later. So thanks again. Pleasure. Thank appreciate you, it. Kevin. So um, I have dropped some additional notes into the, um, into the, the chat here, um, just a link to summary of the legislation that was released in the House of Representatives uh, on, on Wednesday, um, on Tuesday. Uh, so, um, you know, Wes, we've got a few minutes left. Um, can you walk us through this 1800 page bill in three minutes? Does that, have you been working on your speed reading? Yeah, we'll go page by page. We good. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, uh, so, you know, what I think, um, are there particular things that, um, that you see in there? that you think stand a better chance or a worse chance maybe of making it through um, whatever a negotiation pops up? Yeah, it's a good, good, uh, good question. Just kind of, you know, just to back up this, you know, people have seen this bill is, you know, 1800 pages. It's like $3 trillion in overall cost. Um, it's a big, big package. It's, you know, put together by the House Democrats without Republican input. So, you know, it's not going to, you know, move forward uh, as it stands. Obviously, the Republican Senate, as Kevin points out, is going to have to have their input on that, as well as the administration, right? So we have to see what the president comes out with in response to this and how he, uh, his team wants to react to this, what their priorities uh, are. Um, you know, but in this, in this bill, just, you know, the big highlights obviously are more spending in various uh, areas, which is helpful for the, for the sector and different uh, programs, et cetera. You know, the PVP program in particular, I think, is one where the sector has been advocating to push for, and Kevin points out with his letter, to expand that to include all nonprofits, which, which, the, which the bill does. Uh, there is a, 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 a set-aside carve-out for 25% uh, of existing funds uh, in, that, in that bill. Now, uh, I think it's existing funds at the day of enactment, so if this doesn't get acted until, you know, mid to early June, the, fund, uh, the funds available at that point could be could be quite small. So 25% of a set aside that's become a small set aside might be too much at that, that point. So that could be something that we need to think about as a sector to work on to maybe make it a set dollar amount or to work to get uh, the PVP program more funding. I anticipate if this is going to take until mid-June to get done, uh, the PVP program might actually run out of money again uh, by then. There could be a, a push in the Senate to have another round of, uh, of increases in funds. I haven't seen that uh, quite yet, but that's kind of think where this could be going. So the set aside that the House bill has, we'd like to preserve in the Senate and preserve in the final version. We got to make sure that's that's a good amount uh, for the sector to, to utilize in there. Um, so there's some positive uh, pieces uh, in, in that as well. Uh, there's also a language in there about the Main Street uh, program for nonprofits. As you as you know, there's a larger you know you know mid mid size 500 to 10,000 employee. Uh, provision in the CARES Act to give Treasury and the Fed ability to put forth some loan programs. Uh, not forgiveness in there, in that current program, but you know, the House would, 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 will expand that to, to help nonprofits uh, get better access to that program, have their own uh, program within that uh, Main Street uh, loan program through Treasury. So that's a positive development for large organizations uh, as, as well in that, in that space. Sorry about that technical interruption there. Um, we are going to continue with the Q&A portion of our event this afternoon. Um, so we have a question about which provisions from the SOS Act, um, and folks will remember that that is the, uh, the Moulton Fitzpatrick legislation in the House of Representatives um, seeking to fix the CARES Act. So which of the provisions from that made it into this latest House bill? Um, Wes, can you highlight some of those for us? Yeah, sure, Ben. Uh, uh, that bill kind of touched upon uh, expansion PVP uh, loan program, unemployment insurance, and the uh, universal charitable deduction uh, aspects of the CARES Act. 
Um, this new uh, bill out from the House, it only touches upon uh, from that bill, the PPP uh, program expansions, which are very positive for the uh, nonprofit sector. It would expand the eligibility of the program generally to the end of the year, expand the loan forgiveness uh, period from eight weeks to 24 weeks. In particular, it would, uh, which is not part of the Molten Bill, but it was, was part of the expansion here, but part of the Molten Bill was to expand it to include all nonprofits, 500 uh, employees, which the uh, House bill does. Um, it does have a carve out in the managed amendment that was considered uh, it's being considered today uh, to limit that to uh, not include 501c4s that have uh, lobbying activities in, in there. Um, so it could be part of the, 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 the bill. Um, it also has uh, in this new bill a set aside or a carve out for nonprofit um, um, entities to get loans. 25% of existing funds would be set aside for uh, loans to nonprofits as part of the uh, part of the House bill. On PVP expansion, okay. not the other provisions. Okay, great. Um, and we have an additional question about the um, National Service Feasibility Study, um, which unless everyone else has been digging through 1800, it means some folks have read our summary document. So thank you for that. Um, and so I'll just note the, um, that study requires the Corporation for National Community and Service to examine new and existing programs, partnerships, organizations, and grantees that could be utilized to respond to the COVID-19 national emergency. Um, and it lays out a number of provi provisions and things that need to be included in that study. Uh, to be delivered within 30 days of enactment of this legislation. Um, you know, just one, I guess, additional piece of context on this. There was legislation introduced in the Senate to significantly expand national service to respond to COVID. Um, and so, you know, this, I think, ought to be considered, um, in, you know, in light of, in light of that. Um, so um, again, thank you all for those questions. Uh, as we look forward, I think we have a lot of a lot of questions together about assuming the House of Representatives passes this bill tomorrow, and we can never assume anything. Um, what the next steps going forward are? So you know, Wes, we heard a little bit from Kevin about this, but um, but what is your sense? Yeah, thanks, Ben. I think the outlook here is uh, timing is is fairly uncertain. It's pretty clear the House is going to take up the bill uh, tomorrow. Um, should be a long day in the House. They have a couple different votes, and they're trying to space out votes uh, for members to be on the floor only a few at a time. And so it'll probably be a late night on Friday tomorrow night before they pass the actual uh, bill. The House, um, given that it's going to be a partisan uh, vote without Republican support. Um, it goes over the Senate, we're there uh, in session next week, then out uh, the following week for the Memorial Day uh, uh, week break. And I don't expect the Senate to take it up next week or the following week they're out of session. And so it's probably not going to be uh, really considering the Senate until the uh, you know, first part of June. Uh, there's going to be a negotiation have to take place between the Senate Republicans and Democrats because you have to pass it on a bipartisan basis, get 60 votes at least in the Senate to pass major legislation of this uh, nature. And obviously, the administration uh, needs to weigh. They have not, um, other than pushing for a payroll tax cut, they've not really uh, been uh, vocal on what they want in this next uh, package. Obviously, um, what Pelosi put out, how Democrats are going to pass tomorrow is a $3 trillion package, a lot of things in there, 1,800 pages, as you mentioned. So a lot of things for them to kind of uh, digest, respond to. And so it'll definitely be a response and negotiation, but we really aren't clear as to what, uh, you know, the Republicans are going to put on the table in response to this. Uh, Leader McConnell in the Senate has been focused uh, as a top priority in getting some uh, liability relief for employers that come back to work and how that impacts uh, them uh, as they open up their doors and, and think people back to work and back to business. Um, that's obviously a priority, but what else beyond that, uh, you know, McConnell and certain Republicans really want is unclear. So uh, this is going to be, you know, more of a drawn out, uh, you know, several week exercise. Obviously there's pressure to do something given the economy, but a quick, quick exercise poll. We're way into June, um, is my sense, before this gets finalized. Okay. 
uh, alarming, but good to know. Thank you. Uh, so again, I will I will note the summary of the Heroes Act that was um, published on the IS website. Um, you know, there are a number of things in there that the we didn't talk too much about today. Um, you know, has to pay for a broad range of nonprofits, um, funding for safe and healthy elections, funding for um, increased access to broadband internet. Um, things that independent sector and a number of other nonprofit organizations have been advocating for, um, for the health of the whole. Uh, and so I would encourage folks to check that out there. With that, we again want to thank you for joining us today. Thank you, Wes. Thank you again to Kevin Kincello from Senator Lankford's office. Um, we are so honored to be standing with all of you in this effort. And we look forward to talking to you next week. We have um, another exciting guest, Nina Oslutin Shelley from Americans for the Arts. We'll be um, talking about, you know, not just their their own efforts, but how nonprofit organizations that that maybe aren't front and center right now can um, can make sure that they're um, they're being as active as possible in the policy space. Um, so again, thank you, and we look forward to seeing you next week.